Hi everyone. So I want to finish this section or this week by talking about a little bit about the beginning of um, chapter seven, which is about if and only if statements and how to prove them. Uh, and there isn't a tremendous amount new, uh, except to be aware that in an if and only if statement, you have to prove really two things. So let's, uh, let's make this more concrete by looking at some examples. So um, if, uh, if, if a theorem says that two statements are equivalent, or if it says that P is true if and only if Q is true, then this means that you're going to have to prove two things. Both P implies Q and Q implies P. This is the kind of logical fact that P if and only if Q is the same, is logically equivalent to P implies Q and Q implies P. So that's what, uh, that's what you have to prove. So here's an example. Uh, I took this from chapter seven. So suppose you have an integer A. Uh, the claim is that A is even if and only if AQ plus A squared plus A is even. So um, there are two claims. The first one says that if A is an even number, then AQ plus A squared plus A is even. And the second claim is that if AQ plus A squared plus A is even, then A is even. And you have to prove each of these things separately. So the proof of an if and only if statement typically looks like this. It'll say, first, we show one direction and then we show the other direction. And those are typically two paragraphs. If you have an if and only if statement and you don't have two paragraphs, one of which proves one direction and the other of which proves the other, then you've omitted something. It's actually a common mistake. So just for the sake of completeness, let's prove this result. So if A is even, then we know that A is 2K for some integer K. And therefore, A cubed plus A squared plus A is 2K cubed plus 2K squared plus 2K, which is 8K cubed plus 4K squared plus 2k, which is 2 times 4k cubed plus 2k squared plus k. And since we see that a cubed plus a squared plus a is 2 times an integer m, where m is the integer 4k cubed plus 2k squared plus k, we conclude that a cubed plus a squared plus a is even. So that's one direction. The second paragraph of the proof begins when we say now, we show that if a cubed plus a squared plus a is even, then a is even. And here we can assume that it's easiest, I think, to um, prove this not directly, but using the contrapositive, because a cubed plus a squared plus a even implies a even is the same as not a even, so a odd implies not a cubed plus a squared plus a even, or a cubed plus a squared plus a odd. And we could go through this. So a odd means a is 2k plus 1 for some k in z. And then a cubed plus a squared plus a is 2k plus 1 
cubed plus 2k plus 1 squared plus 2k plus 1. And I could expand this out, or I could cheat a little bit here and use the fact that a cubed plus a squared plus a is a sum of three odd numbers. So a cubed plus a squared is even. That's the sum of two odd numbers. And therefore, a cubed plus a squared plus a is odd because it's an odd plus an even. And so we conclude that a cubed plus a squared plus a is odd. So the two, um, and, uh, and therefore the result that we originally wanted, that a cubed plus a squared is even implies a is even, is also true. And so we have shown the if and only if. When you're doing this, uh, you notice in this part, we, we switch to the contrapositive, and that it, it can be confusing sometimes. You, you want to make sure that you don't mix up the contrapositive and the converse. So you don't, for example, want to prove, uh, I mean, the converse is the thing you already proved, that a even implies a cubed plus a squared plus a is even. So um, that's something you just need to be careful about. Let's look at another example. Suppose that a is an integer then 14 divides a, if and only if 7 divides a, and 2 divides a. So this is saying that if you're a multiple of 14, you're a multiple of 7 and a multiple of 2. Maybe this is obvious to you. It, one way to show it is that it's a consequence of um, unique factorization into primes. Um, but uh, we're going to take it uh, one step at a time. So first we suppose that uh, 14 divides a. So 14 divides a, and I'm going to give a slightly, um, I'm going to use unique factorization into primes instead of the argument which is given in the book and is slightly, there's another problem worked out in the, in the text, which is essentially the same using, I think, 3, 2, and 6. But so suppose 14 divides a. Well, then a is 14k for some k and z. And therefore, a is 7 times 2k. And so a is a multiple of 7. And um, a is 2 times 7k. So a is a multiple of 2. That's one direction, and it's kind of the easy direction. The other direction is, suppose that 7 and 2 both divide a, then 14 divides a. So the reason, so the reason this is maybe not totally trivial is that, let's look at a slightly different example. Uh, suppose instead of 7 and 2, we used 6 and 4. So this is a little side remark here. Suppose 6 and 4 divide a. Does 24 divide a? And the answer in that case is no, because consider 12. 6 divides 12, and 4 divides 12, because 6, 12 is 2 times 6, and 12 is 3 times 4, but 24 does not divide 12. So there's something special about 7 and 2, um, and so this, you know, and that's, uh, that's coming into play here. So um, what we're going to use is we're going to use the fact that we know uh, 
by unique factorization into primes, so now this is the end of the side remark. Let's prove this result. We know by unique factorization into primes that A is a product of prime numbers and the list of such primes is determined by A. It's unique. So further, so also 2 and 7 are prime numbers. And since 2 divides A, 2 must be one of the prime numbers dividing A. And since 7 divides A, 7 must be one of those prime numbers So if 2 and 7 both divide, are both among those prime numbers, then they, um, that means that the, the prime factorization of A must equal 2 times 7 times possibly other primes. And therefore, 14 divides A. If you don't like this proof, you can uh, look in the text at the one which is where they prove something for 2 and 3 and see if you can adapt it to, um, to 7 and 2. The difference between my side remark and the problem that we're looking at is that 6 and 4 aren't prime, so you can't use this unique factorization into primes argument. There's a slightly fancier version of an if and only if statement, uh, and that's evidenced by this theorem, which is quoted in the book, and which you may have seen in your linear algebra text. And this approach is done when you have a whole bunch of properties, all of which are equivalent to one another. So the way this theorem is stated is, suppose you have an n by n matrix. They should probably have said with real entries. then the following statements are equivalent. It's invertible. Linear equations with A have a unique solution. The only solution of the equation AX equals 0 is this trivial solution X equals 0. So the kernel of the matrix A is just 0. The reduced row echelon form of A is the identity matrix. Its determinant is not 0, and 0 is not an eigenvalue. It doesn't matter if these words don't mean anything to you, although if you've taken linear algebra, they should sound at least familiar. But the point is, if a matrix has any one of these properties, it has all of them. That's what, it, that's what the statement of the theorem means when they say that all of these statements are equivalent. It means that if I give you a matrix A whose determinant is not 0, then you know that it's invertible, linear equations have a unique solution, and so on. If I tell you that the reduced row echelon form of A is the identity, then all the other properties hold. How do you prove something like this? Well, one way is you could prove that each statement is equivalent to the next. You could go, if A is invertible, then AX equals B has a unique solution. If AX equals B has a unique solution, then the matrix is invertible, and so on, and work your way through it. But you can actually do this in a more efficient way uh, using the idea of a cycle proof. And the logical idea behind this is, suppose you have a series of implications. So you have statements, and you have that P1 implies P2, and P2 implies P3, and P3 implies P4, and so on. And then at some point, you have an nth statement, and it implies P1 again, so that there's a closed loop. So in this example, that would be if the first property implies the second, the second property implies the third, the third property implies the fourth, and so on. Um, by the way, you can see this really quick. If A is invertible, 
if you remember your linear algebra, then you can solve ax equals b by multiplying by a inverse and get x equals a inverse b. And then if you apply the unique solution to the equation ax equals 0, since x equals 0 is a solution, it must be the only solution because the solutions are unique. That at least gets you this far. And then you have to remember what some of these other things mean. But in each case, you can show the next statement from the preceding one. But what is it that makes it if and only if is at the very, very, very end, you then prove that f implies a. And that's what makes this cycle. And the point here is that the truth table for something like this, either all the statements are true. If this cycle, if every implication is true, then either all the statements are true or all they're, they're all false. And, and let's see why that's true. So suppose that, suppose P1 is true. Well, then P1 implies P2 true means P2 has to be true, right? Because an implication where the hypothesis is true is only true if the conclusion is true. So now P2 is true, so P3 is true, and you go dot, 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 all the way down to Pn is true, and therefore P1 is true. So if P1 is true, all the statements have to be true. Um, if P1 is false, well, then Pn implies P1 is true, right? So if, if you have a, an implication and the conclusion is false, the hypothesis had better be false. So Pn is true, or false. And then if Pn is false, Pn minus 1 is false. And you work your way backwards, all the way back down the chain. And you get that all the statements are false. So in a situation where you want to show that a whole bunch of properties, any one of which implies all the others, you don't have to prove each pair of them are equivalent, but you can show that the first one implies the second, the second one implies the third, the third one implies the fourth, and then the fourth implies the first. And that's good enough to close the loop because of this little discussion. So that's the end of this uh, discussion of if and only if proofs. We will uh, move on in chapter seven in the next, uh, the next week.